it's all about relationships. So business is business, but business hinges upon and sits on relationships. Yeah. And you can't have a successful business without successful working relationships. Business of Architecture UK, episode 59. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am, of course, Ryan Willard. I am the host of the Business of Architecture UK. And um, this week's episode, it was, these are the episodes that I like conducting a lot because every so often, you know, the, the joy of podcasting for me is usually going and having a one-to-one meeting face-to-face and being able to meet somebody, talk with them. I often go and visit uh, the fantastic, interesting offices of architects. Sometimes I do it over over Zoom just because it's more practical, particularly with international uh, architects. Um, but every so often I get invited to conduct the podcast inside of a recently completed building of an architect's and that for me is the the pinnacle of podcasting it's the most exciting thing to do it's always a joy and it's fantastic to be able to celebrate and hear the business and entrepreneurial story around winning such a project and the kind of process that it goes through to get it complete and so this interview was such um, as I speak with Tarek Merlin, who is the director and co-founder with Julia Fikes of Fikes Merlin Architects. Um, Tarek is incredible. He was absolutely fascinating, um, brilliant, commercially minded and intelligent design-led architect. Not only has their work got the sort of strong foundations and entrepreneurial underpinnings of good business acumen, but it's also looks absolutely incredible and works and is just you know it's fine high good quality design it's brilliant um and so we got to do the interview in the conduit which is one of their recently completed projects which is a socially conscious private members club in mayfair so again if it's a private members club in mayfair even better um type of locations to do a podcast so this was great the building looks fantastic they've done an incredible job and Tarek speaks a lot about how they won the project, what it meant for the practice um, in terms of their growth, their expansion as this was the kind of, you know, this is one of those sort of game changing projects. This is a real uh, milestone in their career trajectory and the growth of their practice and they've recently gone on to win the Woolworth Town Hall redevelopment which is again is, is another huge and fantastic project for uh, for Fikes Merlin and um you know, Tarek has been educated at the Bartlett, he's worked at Foster's, he's worked with Allsop, um, he's an advocate and campaigner for the LGBT community, um, as is Julia, and that, you know, that kind of, that inclusivity and that commitment to the sort of civic values and to uh, the community of architects, I think really kind of comes through in this interview, and, you know, Tarek's stress on the importance of developing great relationships and just simply being a fantastic human being is you know one of the big keys uh, to the growth and success of their practice so really really in- I enjoyed doing this interview it was brilliant so I hope that you uh, enjoy it just even if it was just as half as much as I did doing it then this will be a massive success so sit back and relax listen to Tarek Merlin. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. My name is Ryan Willard and today I am with Tarek Merlin who is half of Fikes and Merlin. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure to sit down and talk to you here in this, probably one of the nicest environments I've had the opportunity to come and do an interview in. Normally it's in office meeting rooms of terrible acoustic but where are we today? We are now on the sixth floor of the Conduit Members Club on Conduit Street in Mayfair, and we're sitting in the lovely extension that we built on the uh, roof terrace. So we've got a lovely view across here through the um, the windows and doors we put in across London, and it is great to have you here. We're very lucky, actually, because this is a private members club, but we managed to sneak in. I like it. That's, so it's all good. No, that's one of the, one of the perks of doing this uh, doing, <laughs> the, doing the podcast. Exactly. Um, so when was this project completed? So we've been working on it for a number of years. It was about a year and a half to uh, in design and a year and a half on site. 
and it completed in December 18 with a phase completion into the early part of this year, February, March 2019. And we did that uh, really so that the client could get in and start operating because it was a long uh, time on site. So they needed to get here and get their members in. So we phased the build and we completed certain levels before others so that they could get in and start operating, which is really important to them from a business perspective. Yeah. And also really good for us to be on site with the client and agree and complete things as we were going through the other floors. So it's quite helpful in the end. Excellent. And so the, the practice, Fikes, Merlin, you've been going since 2006, am I correct? We started working together in 2006. So it was set up by myself and the amazing Julia Fikes. Yeah. We spent a decade working together, working for Will Allsop. So okay. we met in the early 2000s and stayed with Will to 2010. And about halfway through, um, we started working on our own projects together. So I was working on uh, some big delivery projects for Will and Julie was working on some big master plans. And about halfway through, we kind of crossed over and we're like, oh, and we kind of started working on little competitions and we won our first competition and we were shortlisted on our second competition. So we were like, oh, we're doing something's going well here. The shortlisting on our second competition was against my old tutor, Neil McLaughlin. Okay. Like, We've got to win this. <laughs> he won it because he's a charming, incredibly talented architect. And uh, Will was very generously and graciously gave us time in the week to work on our own projects, which was wonderful of him. And he supported us, tried to introduce us to people. And we sort of went from there. But as you probably know, in the mid to late 2000s, there was a giant recession that seemed to last forever. So Julia and I continued working for other people as well as together for, for our, on our own projects. Right, because you were kind of moonlighting, if you yeah. like, whilst, yeah. whilst the early days of the practice. Exactly. And, and how did you find that? Did you find that generally, so Will was obviously quite accommodating of that yeah. and almost sounds like he was encouraging. He was very encouraging. Um, and most mostly people were because they understood generally that people love to work on their own projects and architects in particular seem to have a dream to have their own business. Um, and it was always, there was always kind of synergy. So we would do generally at that time lots of big pop-up events for developers and meanwhile use uh, events and we would invite our then employers and other people we were working with to the events and so everybody knew it was a very open kind of lovely um, synergy between mm. the creative work we were doing with Fikes and Merlin and the a sort of higher end developer work we were doing for our employers and I started teaching a little bit at Brighton University and it's a classic uh, sort of exit strategy isn't it from full-time employment into running your own business so that we were able to bank some money in those 10 years when we were working for other people right. and not take it as salary we were taking small dividends and bonuses but didn't need to take a full salary and then I started teaching and Julia travelled to Sao Paulo with her wife and worked there for two years and was able to work then full time on Fikes and Money projects. And then I was part time for two years and then eventually... Right, so you were actually working, we were working in dif different locations. Yeah, well f for a number of years in London we were working remotely because we were working for different people. Yeah. Together on Dropbox and Skype and obviously physically whenever we could get together. And then... Um, very remotely with her in Sao Paulo and me in London and Brighton. But it was a really great stepping stone when mm. we're looking back because she was able to work full time. I was able to work part time. And then when she came back to London, it sort of coincided with us getting our first big job and we needed an employee and we needed some desks. And then we had a studio with a printer and two employees and us. So it suddenly snowballed into a studio quite rapidly as soon as Junior came back from London, she takes all the credit for it, and, as she should. And so, how, and so how long was that period before you kind of went full-time into Fikes Merlin? Um, we say it's basically 10 years going on five, our business. So yeah. it, we took 10 years working together as just two, through a recession, making, making it work, and delivering some really lovely projects along the way. What was the nature of those types of projects? Um, a lot of private residential. So we did some, uh, one of our favorite projects is um, a home for an artist and magician in Hoxton Square. Oh, that's a good brief. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a new extension, which had the most amazing view of the city, <clears throat> flooded with natural light, the roof light and, and the full, fully glazed critical um, elevation that he uh, uses as a painting studio, does these huge, portrait um, paintings 
And then, you know, a seven-storey warehouse building completely refurbished with a magic room in the basement that you pull a lampshade on the wall and the bookcase opens, that kind of level. Um, Love it. It was a beautiful, wonderful, magical project. And, and then mix that with some work for larger scale developers, <clears throat> but on smaller parts of their projects and meanwhile use and smaller pavilions and things like that. So some a great kind of wonderful mixture of large scale development, private educational institutions like mm. LSE, Sadler's Wells and private um, residential clients. So it was a really a great kind of ground to learn our craft across a number of different disciplines. So that when we came to start running a studio, we already had a really good base, a client base, to um, to work from and project forwards from. And how and how were you winning those initial clients? This question is always difficult to answer. I think because it it is it is the old adage of it is what you know, but it is predominantly who you know and mm. how you can. Um, get on with your network and we've always just said it's all about relationships so business is business but business hinges upon and sits on relationships yeah and you can't have a successful business without successful working relationships so for example the LSE client is a wonderful man Julian Robinson he's head of estates at LSE we met whilst working for Will also 10 years prior and just stayed in touch because we liked him we liked each other he enjoyed working with me when I was at also and subsequently gave us some work in our own right with the LSE. Um, there's stories like that that we could track back our clients from an initial meeting somewhere, some of which were getting drunk at MIPIM 10 years ago, some of which are networking at an office event, some are working together on a project that then leads to another project. Yeah. It's just kind of a lovely tangled web of working relationships. Well, it's, it's interesting because it's kind of a lot of architects... Sometimes it's something that we do naturally. We don't think about it. We're naturally networking. We're naturally mm. out there. And we've got a kind of uh, something in the background of our minds goes, just keep that relationship yeah. ticking away because you never know. And also just the way that you've just described that as the kind of the length of time that it took for you before you kind of went full time into it is also indicative of nurturing those kinds of relationships. And yeah. and what, what kind of things did you do? You might not have thought about this before, but like, did you do to keep those relationships alive um i'm not sure yeah it's a hard one to be specific about primarily it's just being human beings i think we uh we don't i honestly don't go to mipim with the or, or to any networking event <clears throat> with the strategy of i've got to go and see this guy i've got to meet that person and get in with them <clears throat> it's really just about trying to find people that you get on with because you can't work with people that you don't get on with. They won't enjoy it and we wouldn't enjoy it. So it's not going to result in an enjoyable project yeah. for anybody. So it's just about finding those other human beings that share the same kind of rapport that, that you have and and building building on that. So I don't think there's a... Um, if that's a strategy, that's a strategy to find people that you get on with yeah. and, uh, and stick to them because they're the ones that will give you work and they're the ones that w will... Um, recommend you to other people and that you'll enjoy working with because we've got to enjoy ourselves whilst we're working we can't be um, working and not enjoying ourselves in our view so you've got to spend I think I guess that's what we did over those preceding 10 years was just take our time with our projects and, and meet the right people and, mm. and find the people that we enjoyed working with and they enjoyed working with us and so how did the culture of the studio change when you went when you had that, yeah. that first that first larger project, which enabled you both to kind of go full time, and what was it like? The mindset shift for you we now? We were just very excited. We'd been waiting for that moment to build our little creative studio, little family or tribe for ten years. We were thinking about it and drawing. We actually drew our studio and the people in it and how it might work. It's one of those things. It's like it never works out the same way that you imagine it to, because it's kind of life happens as you're doing it. And it's been a fairly rapid growth, although from two people to ten people now in five years, um, it's fairly rapid and we've had to learn a lot of new skills along the way. So when it was just us two, it was fairly easy to do accounts and marketing and HR, because it was just us. And then in the last five years, growing and elevating our team, 
uh, is suddenly a whole new mm. skill set. So we have to do financial projections and check what we can and can't afford to buy computers and software and do HR contracts and make sure everybody's happy and think uh, more holistically about creating a little family, which is what it's really like. Uh, and as in all families, there's a little kind of things you have to deal with along the way that you weren't expecting that you have to look after people and understand their dreams as much as your own mm. and build them up and in fact that's one of the key things we've learned is to try and because when it was just us two it was always just us two and the creative focus was two of us and we have to really now take a step back and like shut up let them talk about it and let them develop the ideas which is really lovely actually I love that when somebody and, surprises you. Oh, and how, how does that mean, how does your role change then from mm. when you were working, two of you, to now kind yeah. of more, lead, it's more like a leadership position and more you're facilitating design in other people? Yes, yes. I mean, we've both had very good experience in doing that for, for other employers, so it's not a um, radical change for us um, in that we, I've managed big teams, multi-international teams before as a senior project architect, but as has Julia, um, but when you're doing it for yourself, it is slightly different. It is different because you have to be an inspirational figure at the head of a business and also inspirational in terms of design and um, supportive. So you're at the inspirational end and you're also growing somebody's talents and mm. dreams up from inside them and they might not recognize them yet as well. So you have to be kind of uh, a, you know, a guardian of, of uh, careers and help people reach their potential because that's good for them and it's good for you and it's good for the little family we're growing as a whole and how do you do that again i think it's just about being a human being because we're just connecting with people and understanding who they are all of our team we have a very talented team of architects and interior designers and they're it's kind of architects that think like interior designers and interior designers that think like architects and we try and especially when we work on projects you know like like the conduit here we we work very um, holistically with the interior and the exterior, and that's kind of our mantra that we work from the inside out. The mm. internal experience moves towards the architecture rather than the architecture dictating the internal experience. Um, but that that is a kind of um, similar story with the, the team members, that you have to work with them, what they've got inside them, and bring them out. And I don't know, there's no fixed strategy or way of doing that. It's just about being human with them and understanding what what their wishes and desires are and seeing if you can get that for them because there's no guarantee you get the exact kind of work that that member of staff wants to do. Yeah. But we uh, always try and make our give the right pieces of work to the right pieces of staff. It, it's interesting because these are, these are the things that we never sort of necessarily discuss in business as well or in architecture is actually that it is it is a people driven yeah, business and the quality of relationships is like fundamental to the quality of architecture it's the fun it's fundamental to the quality of the culture of mm. the organization and the little things and actually being human actually like yeah. putting that as a priority rather than you know we are just trying to execute and get results yeah. actually the being human aspect of it is what makes a very strong foundation for yeah. great architecture for great business for profitability it's at the it's yeah. at the heart of everything yeah, absolutely i think it's you know it's basic common sense that unhappy person is going to be in um is not going to be driving at their full capacity because they're sitting around being unhappy yeah a happy person is going to be coming to work and loving life and getting on with things and enjoying themselves and to give people happiness, they have to feel motivated and challenged and interested and engaged, but also feel like we're thinking about them culturally and their growth as um, the kind of CPD series that we run, the events that we go to together, and just kind of, we do regular formal reviews, of course, but just kind of chatting to them about what their, how their workload is going and what what kind of angle they're finding the most interesting is always kind of yeah. informing us for the next bit of work that we give them. And how, how have you started to view your business now sort of strategically? What kind of, how have you started to like start sh shifting the directions or mm. what directions and how you decide which directions you're, you're going into? Yeah, so we, well, um, interestingly, this project was a big kind of pivotal moment, a tipping point, they call it for us in a business in that, it, um, 
Although we've done many large-scale, multi-million-pound projects before for other people, this is our first large-scale, multi-million-pound project under our um, brand and our financial liability. Mm. So it was about sticking our heads above the parapet, making, at the time, <clears throat> we were reasonably... We had some hesitations about taking on that lead designer role because it is the, the pivotal point on terms of liability. But it, in the end, it's just what architects do. This is what our job is, to coordinate and liaise with the client and coordinate with a massive design team. So it gave us confidence, and I think that is key to any business, is to be confident and to be striding forwards. I think to not change and not evolve as a business or anything as a city is to stagnate. How, and how did this project come about? Um, it was a very interesting pitching process with Russell Sage Studios, who are very good friends of ours, interior designers, and we pitched via Skype to the three founders of The Conduit, Nick Hamilton, Ryan Finnegan and Paul Van Ziel, who were all in different time zones across <laughs> the world. So it was one of the most unusual pitches I've ever done because you have to, you don't get that sort of natural human uh, interaction via a Skype screen and they were Slight all like time delay <laughs> <laughs> um, but we got the job so something must have gone well yeah. and I think it was again us talking about I think what got it for us is that the what lies at the heart of the conduit is this philosophy of sustainability and I'm assuming some of the other teams were blasting at them um, codes and Briam excellent and trying to tick boxes with the mm. we had a chat with them about you know this is central and we're not going to shove big turbines on the roof um or do some grand gesture why don't we approach that that philosophy of sustainability just very, in a very common sense way not try and hit any of these codes or excellent targets just think about what we're doing with the building reuse reclaim as much as possible which we did and use natural materials wherever possible over any non-natural so this is um natural hemp plaster which has been used throughout the building. And it's a very small decision to be made, but it it's, has a huge impact on the air quality in the space mm. um, and the fact that we're using a natural-based material rather than a man-made-based man -based material. And um, it has a wonderful visual and physical texture as well, so it has that kind of aesthetic quality and the, the well-being quality to it. So that, and I've mentioned a few other things that we said to them, well, wherever possible, we'll reuse things, and we did. We took doors off the building here and, sh and put them on the wall on the fourth floor to create a wall feature that, that at the time we were a bit worried about. But when it's all painted white, it looks absolutely stunning. So I think they just responded to our fairly common sense approach to what could be a very complex issue of sustainability to mm. just say it's not sustainable to... Uh, strip a building out and rebuild it, yeah, but we'll do it in the most sustainable way. So we've got hydroponic green walls, we've got regenerative lifts, we've got the hemp plaster, we've got um, um, furniture that is sourced sustainably that's made in um, out of timber, but is also made by people who are local artisans. And so they've they've done a kind of real holistic um, way of thinking about sustainability rather than that. And, and how did you get to be on that sort of shortlist for pitching? I think that was through a recommendation um, via Russell Sage Studio and others in the industry because the, the main board is a board of 8 to 12 people I think and the three key clients, one of them that just walked past that I waved to, <laughs> um, uh, were making the key decisions and I think there was just I think it's back, I don't actually know the detail of how, but I think it's back to that issue we were talking about of human relationships and people will um, advise other people about who to work with. Yeah. It was also Gardner and Theobald with the project managers and they knew us as well, so it may have been a combination of all those things. And had you worked with Russell Sage Studio before? Yes, yes, so we've done, we did a few projects, food and beverage hospitality projects with them before and really enjoyed it and it's sort of a real kind of example of how we can work really well with other interior designers so we can be an interior designer's architect or we can be the architect that does the interior design and vice versa actually there are, there are some projects we're working on for example a big big new hotel in hamburg which we are doing the interior design of and a little hotel in london that we're doing 
the RSS, Russell Sage Studio, are doing the interior design and we're doing the architectural execution. So it's a, it's a lovely kind of mixed bag of how interior design and architecture overlap and mm. interlay within our work. And how do you, how do you what are the sort of keys to success, are those kinds of successful collaborations? <clears throat> yeah, just being um, open and honest with the team, which is, I think, a key thing on any architectural project. You've got to work really well with the team. And I think that's where Julia comes in. She excels at very detail. She's got an amazing eye for detail. And it means that she'll spot in advance something, an issue that will be coming up later that other people won't have spotted and she'll fix it with the design team before it happens. <clears throat> and if there are issues that happen on site in particular that are unavoidable, like discoverable issues that, you, that happen on the day, mm. it's just about being present and, and working with somebody, again, on a human level to say, let's not do this blame game thing, let's work together and solve out how we fix it before we even need to raise it as an issue. So when you raise it an is as an issue, here's the issue, here's the solution, it's done, everyone's agreed. It might have a cost or time implication, but that might be unavoidable, but we've got the solution sorted. And obviously we try and avoid those secondary implications as much as possible. But that's sort of where the skill of the senior architect role comes in. Yeah. It's not just about being able to detail, uh, it, it's also about being able to carry the, the whole design team forward. And I think that is an exceptional skill that Julia has. She's able to, you know, remember the email that was sent out six months ago that had that issue, as well as the particular detail that we're doing right now on the table, and and marry the historical information up with the immediate issues. Which I think is that is a very good skill. Not many people have that. Yeah, being able to, yeah, being able to bring out bring together those kind of details. Yeah. But so a project like this. Um, how has it kind of changed the direction of your practice? Right, yes. We were talking a little bit about that, weren't we? Because so I, I remember I spoke with um, Alex Michaelis a while back and he was saying how they, when they did bits of Soho House, that was a real sort of yeah. game changer for them because yeah. obviously this is one of these kinds of environments where you're going to have, there's a, there's a big audience, yes. essentially, of, yes. of potential new work. And, and funnily enough, a lot of our potential new clients are members here. So when we say we worked on the corner, it's like, oh, I go there. It's one of my favourite places. That's so so nice to hear. Um, but yes, um, to that question, I think it's a really important question. In, in And we were talking about this with one of my friends the other day. In every architect's career, uh, I think they have a pivotal moment and they have maybe a couple or one or two um, pivotal projects that when you look back in five years time you realize that was the tipping point this may well be it because mm. um, like I was saying it, it may made us raise our game and it gave us confidence that we can do the job of the architect that we have always done but under our own steam it's always a little bit more scary well, um, what, what, what were the main the things that were scary about it for just, you? it's just um, the issue of risk of being sued yeah. I mean in the business of architecture uh, particularly when you take that role as lead designer, uh, lead architect, you are the first to be sued when there's a problem. Certainly in, in a less kind of litigious way, you're the first to be told of the problem and first to be, so to, to be demanded to sort it out. And that's just a little bit scary. Yeah. On a large project, this is 40,000 square foot, it's 50 million pound plus project. Um, we've obviously made damn sure that nothing's going to go wrong. Um, but you never know in the future because this is architecture. You carry that liability for twelve years. That's how do you how do you mitigate that risk? What what were the kind of conversations that you had with your insurers? Yeah, we had very detailed conversations with our insurers and the contract that we signed with the client, and thinking very carefully about collateral warranties and doing all that boring stuff we do. Um, but it's very important to know and understand your contract, yeah, and to be very clear with the client if there's something that you're. Sometimes there's things you're just unable to accept because the insurance won't let you. So we had a negotiation like that with the client and we reached a happy compromise in the end about the level of collateral warranties, etc. Um, but the way to ensure that you don't get sued is just to work really hard <laughs> on the project to ensure that you, you maximise architectural quality but at the same time you're minimizing risk and I think minimizing risk in buildings is about making the architectural quality buildable and buildable means being present with the contractor switching up the detailing if you need to switch it up if they if it's not understandable enough if it's not buildable enough if it's not practical how do you get your hand into 
do a screw up on a head detail of a door, how do you get the waterproofing to wrap around a curving mm. arched window head? Um, those are all things that you you may not know at the tender stage in full detail. We, we, we do propose details like that, but then when it comes to site, you need to figure things out. So it's about being present. So Julia was here on site four days a week for a year and a half. And I think that's what projects like this take. Um, and, and so how did that, that ad additional level of diligence and care and attention that's sort of required to deliver a project like this, the additional risk that you're taking on and ensuring that everybody's happy and that you're not getting into any kind of you know, mm. any difficult situations. How did that then get, how did you work out how to compensate yourselves for that in terms of negotiating your fees and... Um, it's about understanding your costs and your future costs over the, let's say, 12 years. And uh, obviously you don't charge the entirety of that to the one project because over the next 12 years there'll be lots of other projects. Um, it, it, I mean, the short answer is it was a very sort of long-winded, detailed look at our fees and our costs over the next 12 years because it's launching us into a higher um, bracket insurance and talking to our insurers about what all these different clauses in the contract mean for our sort of extending our liability from the project to the funders and the, that's what those collateral warranties are about. And of course the wording of how our responsibility and role on the project covers or doesn't cover the roles and responsibilities of the other consultants on the project. Right, okay. I mean. This, we could go on for another hour about the details of a contract and how you need to really go with a fine tooth comb over it and you have to understand it. You can't just leave it to your insurers or your advisors to understand because it starts to inform the way that you operate as the project architect on site. So you have to say to some consultants who want to shy away from some certain issues, if you know we have to nail this and, it, and it's going to be under your badge that that gets nailed, we will be above you and we sign it off. Mm. Um, but it is your responsibility to nail that and that takes a really close working relationship with that team and yeah. doing that in a amiable way. And, and so it comes back to what you were saying before about the sort of the, the fundamentals of, you know, focusing on the human elements of, yeah. of relationships yeah. because you're now dealing with difficult yeah. contractual, yeah, potentially absolutely. litigious situations. We don't, remember architects don't build buildings, builders do. <laughs> yeah. And builders don't just build the buildings on their own, they build all of this information that we have to coordinate. So every consultant on this project worked really, really hard and they produced excellent information that we knitted together and coordinated essentially. So it's never just us, it's never just the contractors, it's, it, it is a big consultant team that involves the client as well and this was a construction management procurement. So the client had to take a pivotal role and making sure that their contractual side was buttoned up and we were being part of that as well with the contractor. That's great. It's actually a really great experience. And just to get back to your question about how this tips us forward, yeah. because um, we just won that Woolworth Town Hall project, yes. which was huge, and that happened in March. So basically a year prior, we'd been pitching for it's it. It's in the Woolworth Road, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's an old town hall building on the Woolworth Road, just south of all the new developments, yeah. south of Elephant and Castle. It's literally at the end of the big new um, residential high-rises. <clears throat> it's been closed for five years or so because it's had fire. It was a terrible fire about five years ago. It, the building, thankfully, still stands in its inherent nature and that the brick walls are there the beautiful tiled staircases are there so what predominantly went is the timber roof structure and some timber floor structures but we have a wonderful building to work with um, but just to say we were coming off the end of a 40,000 square foot 50 million pound building and now going into a 50,000 square foot 20 million pound building and it looks like that's the right trajectory for us all our time preceding this we were doing wondering how am I going to get that little two million pound job is that be perfect and then we got that and then it was a five million would be great wouldn't it that would be it set us off and then suddenly we got this 15 million pound contract value and going into a 20 million pound project is setting us off in this new trajectory that we're so excited about and I think looking back in five years it will be these little not little but big steps that we made in the last two years mm -hmm. 
that will really shape our business as well as our kind of architectural trajectory, which is in in a sort of soundbite is the is the reuse and refurbishment and extension of existing heritage buildings in London. Mm. I think that's a really lovely uh, way of thinking about what our future could be because it is. We would love to do some new build projects, but it is incredibly satisfying taking an old gem and bringing it back to life. The Woolworth Town Hall in particular is a local landmark. It's an old civic building. People got married there. They registered births and deaths there. It's very important to local community, and they've not been in the building for five or six years, and we're going to open the doors hopefully in three years, and um, they'll come pouring into a wonderful new kind of community hub. It's going to be arts and culture, co-working, creative office. There'll be The ground floor is just going to be flooded with a new restaurant, bar, cafe, uh, art displays. You don't have to buy anything. You can just come in and sit down and meet people. And there is a whole part of the building, a sort of a third of the ground floor is going to be purely arts and culture use for the community. No, no profit generation whatsoever. No fees. It's going to be all free to use for the local community, which is wonderful. And we're just <coughs> our developer client is Jacob Loftus from General Projects. <clears throat> We've met him a number of years ago, and we we're like, "Oh God, this guy is great. He is our perfect client." We've and he got on really well with us. And it yeah. was just that story of not. We didn't know that this project was going to come up. He invited us to pitch with them. We've got the job, and now we're doing this amazing project with this amazing client. And he's that kind of developer, doesn't even like using the word developer, that, that sees the human beings in the life that are going to use the building. It's not about generating maximum profit, it's about generating maximum building, yeah, maximum architecture, maximum community benefit. That is absolutely possible. It, a very, very exciting point in yeah. your career and in, Feels like in, it, yeah. in, your, in your business and the growth. On reflection, do you think like it is, it's only possible to kind of grow your practice through these kind of incremental stages or, <laughs> or do, you yeah. think, do you think that you could jump into like doing these large projects or? You could. Uh, we never wanted to do it take 10 years. Yeah. When we were growing up, we were watching the great other architects doing it over 10 years and thinking, we don't have to do it that way. And in fact, in you know, you just need to work really hard and, and work your network and, and make it happen. And in the run-up between 2006 and eight, we were literally about to jump ship and hand in a notice. And we had five or six really great projects with five or six different developers and private clients. And pretty much over the three months into 2008, they just went. The big developer clients put everything on hold. Mm -hmm. The private residential clients paused and we had from eight <coughs> that year down to three and then the subsequent year one project a year for a few years so it was just purely a consequence of a recession that we weren't yet established enough to work our way through and survive with salaries and we don't we were also very keen to never borrow money or put any of our family's money or our own money that we didn't actually have to put in um, to a business we felt that we should uh, the business should operate as itself without a massive investment front end. Yeah. We just, I don't, you know, you can do it that way, but you're taking a big risk and you're taking a big debt liability and we just didn't want to do it that way. And it's almost like kind of using steroids in a way. Yeah. To sort of, it's, you, you don't know where the money's going to end up sort yeah. of dissipating itself to. It, there's lots of different entries into running a business. We just felt that wasn't the right one for us. We wanted the work to generate the money to sustain the business and it was really a consequence I mean I look in hindsight it's easy but it, it's a consequence of the recession that we couldn't generate enough work to sustain sal salaries for two people over those years we had to the benefit of it was that we could bank the money that we were making so that when it came to launch day we we did have a little sinking fund so that we weren't the risk of employing somebody and then not being able to pay their salaries. Uh, we never had to rely on that sinking fund, thankfully, uh, and now it's much bigger because we've got lots more people. So we have our, our business. Um, we've always been advised by lots of different people about how to structure your finances, mm. and we've always been little squirrels squir squirreling away our salaries and saving them for the future, which is when they kicked in when we started with the studio. But we've also got this little bank of money to cover us for at least six months' salaries. Got little 
bank of money for that is a sort of special projects fund like we were talking a bit earlier about um whether we could do some new development projects as architects whether we can um, sustain ourselves our costs so that we can offer the developer a deferred fee structure which we are doing on one of our projects in uh, a site in Cambridge and we're doing that because we have the kind of comfort blanket of knowing we've managed to save some money so mm. um, I think we would be able to survive with that um, deferred fee structure on that project anyway with the current income that we have to spread the load across the people that are working on a non-fee earning project so can you talk a little bit about more yeah. about that about what how the how that came about let's what, talk about that because I think actual it's the, the deal is that you've structured there. Yes, it's, it's a very interesting one because I think um, there's been a lot of discussion. We're not the first people to do it this way, but um, I think it's really important that architects think a bit more broadly about the way that they generate new business and the way that they structure their fees. Um, as, as maybe, I mean, I was going to say, as we all know, maybe we don't all know, but architects maybe need to know a bit more about how developers, what pain they go through in the mm. front end and private clients also. And to face, they have a lot of hard cash costs at front end that include the architect's fees as well as many others. And this model is not right for everybody but and not right for every project. But on this project, we're doing a joint venture between the client who's putting the land in, the developer who's putting their expertise and some hard cash up front to pay for the surveys and planning fees. And ask the architect who are putting our services up front as all three of us then having shares in a joint venture SPV that we will put together, um, that we are putting together now, and the just fee structure. Just people who don't know, can yes. explain what an SPV is? Special purpose vehicle, it's just a company, you form a company together, yeah. and you all own shares, and the number of shares that you have sort of dependent upon, um, well, whatever you negotiate with the client and the developer are going to take the lion's share in this case, we're taking a, good, a very good share, and that is partly... Uh, our share is partly our fees, but it's also in this case, and this is why it's of a benefit to forfeit your fees, for, or defer them rather, is that you then use that, that's an argument to, because um, you're carrying risk, to increase your share in the company more than just what the actual monetary value of the fees were, right? Mm. It's, a, it's common sense, but you know maybe it doesn't, you don't think about that in terms of your fees at the, when you're just giving your fees to a client. So in this way, Yes, you're carrying more risk, but the windfall in three to five years' time is greater than the fees yeah. you would have earned on year one. Um, so, yeah, I would say... Well, it's, in, it's interesting now and, and how you've sort of described as well the context within how that kind of deal is operating for you, mm. where you've had the kind of fiscal discipline to be able to put money away and... Yes, I think that was important because kind of it gives you a bit of confidence um, to be able to take a bit more risk. We're not working hand to mouth, which is, I think, really important for a business to not do. Yeah. Because then you make um, decisions based on that only. Yeah. And I think for a business to thrive, it needs to grow, and growth involves some risk. And we need to be careful about taking risks, but we also need to be a little bit ballsy about taking risks in some cases. And I think this this project I'm talking about with a developer client and us creating a joint venture is a really great it's a new version of working for us but it's one that we always wanted to try and we've we've generated the project ourselves actually we found the site and took it to the developer and knew the client didn't have cash to put in so we sort of orchestrated that deal but it's really kind of learning from this particular developer Gus Zagolovich who's incredibly fun interesting talented and of side space Yes, yeah. <clears throat> and he um, is the right kind of developer for this because he is also about the human aspect of client and architect and, and who we're building for. Um, and he's very open to the issues that the client is facing and open to the risk that we'll be taking and very welcoming about setting this up. So it's going to be a great test model, I think. We should be doing more of this as architects, not just giving our fees proposals and yeah. waiting for it to happen. Um, I think it will basically watch this space. So in three to five years' time, we should have delivered these projects and we should be talking again, if we want to do this again, about how how it's operated financially because as a, at the moment there's a bunch of different options at, at play. So we could all take 
we could we're going to have shares in this company. We could all take uh, a regular rental income, yeah, which could be great for us <clears throat> because it means then we've got a future regular income. <clears throat> Once the work is done, it's going to c- keep coming in. Or we could take a windfall and then reinvest that money and do another development with another developer, or do a development under our own steam because one of the big issues of doing that is equity up front to buy land or to invest. But it's a great model, and we can't actually wait to see how it pans out. And it and it and it's great, particularly for, um, you know you guys being a design led focused practice. Mm. That that what what does that kind of deal enable you to do creatively? Well, I think or that's really interesting because. Um, I think it's important that architects that call themselves design-led practices still, I hope, they still understand their clients and understand their clients' pains and gains, and therefore that's how you give a good service to your client, in in our view. Um, How it's going to uh, affect the architecture is, I think, really important quality, because now we're going to be invested in the pain and the gain. Uh, We we should be doing this in any event, but we're going to be very clearly invested in making and maximizing the efficiencies of the build, achieving the highest architectural quality because that gets your sales value up as high as possible for the market, minimizing your cost uh, per square foot because obviously there's your margin. Yeah. So it's a really going to be a very interesting example, illustration of how the architect can build incredibly efficiently or design incredibly efficiently and get the contractor to build efficiently fast and cost efficiently so that um but but at the same time maximizing architectural quality and that should be the test of any architect client team but it will be much more kind of nuanced here um, focused in the sense that we're going to be part of the profit share at the end yeah and also it's, it's an interesting exercise for you also to sort of start exploring how to communicate the sort of financial value of good design and mm. I, I, know, I know gus and sun space they're very they're, they they understand they that. understand that and they've kind of built their business on delivering the premium quality products as yes a, as, and housing as a result of good design and gus has um taught us the first thing to do is look at comparables in the area and see how architectural quality can be the value add to the comparables. Yeah. So the comparables might be, um, let's say, four hundred pounds a square foot sales value in this region because it's out of London, which normally London's about eight hundred plus. Um, uh, how do we elevate that? We've already been speaking to some local estate agents and looking at local comparables and seeing the architectural quality. And they've already said if something's of this architectural quality or higher, you're talking about more for fifty five hundred pounds a square foot. It's just a very obvious, therefore, black and white um, reasoning to say it, that that is the value add of architectural quality. Mm. And that does not necessarily have to add to the construction cost down here because you can, in our opinion, achieve great architectural quality without adding huge financial cost to the build. Yeah, This is going to be a great test case to show how we can build at their regular um, construction cost for, per square foot was between two and three hundred pounds a square foot, which is, again... That's kind of actually average. It's maybe low, low for Lon- um, London comparables. But we need to keep that there and get the sales values up. And that's going to be a great game. So we've got, Gus has sort of shared his development appraisal with us. And I think every architect should have this Excel spreadsheet. We should, we should ask Gus if he should just like put it on the Reba website for everybody to download. It basically tells you how much everything costs to build how much everything costs to borrow to get funding through planning, architects, structural fees, but also investment, um, the cost of investment funding, and sees how that translates to your bottom line. It helps you then understand what land value is, because the land is only the amount that you can afford to pay for it in Mm. this development appraisal to give you the bottom line and your margin of 20% or more. And it has been a lovely eye-opener, that very simple maths, which when you think about it, yeah, that makes total common sense. But the Excel spreadsheet is actually quite complex because it takes into account all the periods of time which fluctuate and the amounts of interest on the borrowing which fluctuates. So there's a fairly delicate uh, bit of maths to do on the Excel spreadsheet, but at its core, it's how much does it cost to build, how much can you sell it for, and what does it cost you in the time period to do that. Right. And... Um, and the, and what is your land value cost at the beginning and what's your margin at the end 
I think that's brilliant. Like it's it's really simple when you think about it in simple terms. But I'm not sure if I'm sure there are lots of architects that understand that. I'm sure that there are lots of architects that have never seen a dev development appraisal, mm. and they all should. And they all should do that first conversation with your client when he comes saying, "Can you just do a quick feasibility?" And everybody starts sketching a beautiful piece of architecture. The first thing we should do sounds wrong but the first thing we should do is understand where where we sit financially in the clients and developers um business plan and that that will help uh, along with all the other constraints that we have that we, we seem to as architects ignore the financial constraints and we need to open our eyes much wider to those constraints because we know about planning constraints we know about there might be a railway line or a drainage underneath the ground and we're very good mm. at dealing with those constraints um but we need to really bring in the client closer to us yeah and work with them and a lot more but very much as well embracing that kind of financial literacy because it does yeah. open up a whole new uh, realm of creativity yeah. for the architect and being able to deliver better quality work yes and also you know it's fun actually yeah. It, it yeah, i of, think it, it's fun it opens up just <laughs> new new stuff it's maths and excel <laughs> but I really kind of, you know, waller around in it because it helps describe what it is that you should be doing. You you can't, I don't think you can design in that kind of vacuum of pure architecture. And you mm. have to design with the constraints of life. Otherwise, you just... It, it, it. It, it, I mean, it, it always fascinates me. And this is a kind of conversation that comes up quite a lot on the, on the show mm. about as architects in our training you know uh, we are so well versed in every other constraint of the built environment yeah. from the political to you know gender social yes, political yeah. which is um, all valid in, environmentals all that fantastic we never ever deal with the one force that actually shapes the built environment it's more than anything else, which, it's which the, is money exactly and actually when we, we can talk a bit about that but actually because i've written a little piece about how we could bring architecture education closer to practice and that is absolutely a big big caveat here not to say that we should do that at the exclusion of creative thinking but there just needs to be a bit of a better balance i think between architectural education and practice and it is going in the right direction but why isn't there a development appraisal class at, at college why isn't there um, a feasibility study course to teach you how to find a site, look at the constraints, design something that is buildable and affordable and, and of great architectural quality. Whilst at the same time, researching theory, looking at great architects of the past and seeing how that can be brought to bear in the future, and exploring new media and digital technologies and all these new things that universities are absolutely wonderful and pioneering at doing, can, can there be a better balance so that when the young architects come into the profession, they have all these skills and actually they can just jump in on a conversation with a client about feasibility and buildability mm. and, and cost. I think there could be a bit of a better balance. Yeah, to totally. And I, and I also think there's, there's scope and potential there for architects at universities to start thinking about different types of business models, yes. how they can run their own practices and either how they could actually start businesses in different industries. Yeah. Because the architecture education is so... And I think it's so powerful and it's so beneficial. And actually, you know, there's a lot of talk about the expense of architectural education. Well, mm. actually, if we start employing it in other fields mm -hmm. and other disciplines, it becomes yeah. incredibly valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And if you apply a bit more um, sort of business sense to it, a young architect come, could come out, set up a development company, you know, if they've got... if they, Because really, the what Gus has taught us, you don't need all the cash to be a developer. You just need to be clever at obtaining funding. Yeah. So if you understand that psychology of funding projects, you could come out with relatively little equity, set up a development company, as long as you've got the connections and maybe you rely on a, a more senior connection in, the, in your network to help get you that funding. You could start a development company, design and build, and I think a lot of architects could do a lot more. Mm. I mean, this, this um, project we were talking about uh, in Cambridge, we were originally imagining it would be us and the client and we would figure all this out ourselves. We just don't quite have the full skill sets there. We needed the development partner to bring those skills to bear. And we'll learn from him and we will eventually do maybe a smaller project first off our own back. And I just think if we had those skills 10, 20 years ago, when did I graduate? <laughs> um, we could have d done this already. Yeah. Like, and I think now younger emerging architects are doing this. I mean, 
Carl Turner's not young and emerging, but <laughs> he's done this kind of thing. He set up a development company, he's put in some of his own money mm. and some of uh, investment funding to do projects like Pop Brixton. And he's, he, you know, very interestingly has led, led that little kind of part of the profession of having the architects being the investment partners and being the builder and, and being the client developer. And, and, and now as well, there's all these kind of new platforms and ways of gaining funding like peer-to-peer lending yes, and yeah. things like I interviewed yesterday CEO of Crowd Property and Cedars and, yes. and, and stuff like that where yeah. it's just opening up the accessibility to funding and it's already in a kind of uh, a technological culture with which particularly younger architects and people who are at universities are already kind of very fluent in mm. so sort of you know this idea of crowdsourcing kickstartering mm-hmm. yeah. and actually it's not that big a step to you know how some of these these funding platforms are operating yes. that the the culture makes sense already and to start applying yeah. that to you know this, um, this building project that we've just designed as a university project you know what we could actually we could actually build that find a site get the funding um and interestingly it seems like this weird kind of cloudy funding and finance seems kind of this cloudy part of the world that we don't understand but it's really just people who are interested in doing projects and making money and if you can bring to bear the architectural skills to that sector of the business you've just kind of like created this perfect little momentum to create a project and that doesn't take that much of a leap and I think all we need to do as part of the architectural education is understand that part of the profession a bit better like you were saying it's the primary driver it's how you get it's how you realize your architectural vision that you have as a student you're not going to do it on your own like i was saying no you need a massive consultant team you need the client mm. and the developer and the funder and you have to understand everybody's desire lines and work with them i think we just need to understand them a bit better uh, sooner yeah so we were, we were just we were just talking we were just talking about diversity and your role with supporting the lgbt community yes. Um, can you say a little bit about that and what your practice has been doing? Yeah, so we are sponsors of the Architecture LGBT Plus Pride Float this year. And it's a it's a fairly new endeavour, but it's been over the last 10 years sort of bubbling away in the last few years. Uh, so last year was the, the inaugural Architecture Pride Float and the Pride events coming up uh, in a few weeks. And what's really important to the discussions preceding this was uh, a lot of questions from other architects even in the room talking about why why is this needed we're not really in that kind of culture anymore um, however there's some very clear feedback from some surveys like the architects journal survey on this that they do every year actually that shows uh, that there's still quite a significant percentage of people who are not out at work uh, who have suffered homophobia comments and banter on site and so we have come a long way, but there's still a long way to go where if you you know, put it in its basic terms, people are not happy about being honest about who they are at work, which is kind of awful. Yeah. You would feel like you have to lie about you, who you are as a human being yeah. <laughs> to get by in your career. So there's still a need. And I think it's that kind of you know, lazy, latent banter that people make jokes uh, that you don't necessarily challenge people on because at the time it's a bit like, oh, it's just a joke. But you should challenge them and you should just say, oh, sorry, I didn't really appreciate that. Can we not talk in that way? And people, uh, surprisingly, uh, are firstly surprised that they have said something that caused offence. They personally don't realise. So I think it's really important that we're just present and visible and to, to create this slow cultural change, in particular on site. So I was talking about how Julia was on site here at the Conduit and not that we had a very uh, uh, any issues. It's just that she is a very strong woman who is gay, who is running a massive site, uh, running a massive team, dealing with contractors, putting them in their place on sites. <laughs> Uh, and it's just that is just slowly changes the cultural uh, nature of individuals on site and people when they see a powerful woman who happens to be gay, um, and that being completely irrelevant to her ability to do the job. In fact, it is entirely relevant because she is a woman and she is gay. <clears throat> but there's that play of well, that should not be important to you, but it still is important to people because they are surprised by it. Yeah. Oh, it's a woman telling us what to do. Oh my God, did you know she was gay? And then, you know, it changes the tone and character and culture of the working relationship on site. 
So you kind of slowly get rid of the sort of silly boy banter that you we used to get because there's a lot more women on site and there's a lot more um, clarity over issues of diversity, race, um, religion and uh, um, gender um, and sexuality and that is a good thing, it can only be a good thing. In fact my badge here just says, oh, it's upside down, the future is equal and I think that's a very difficult thing to head towards because we know that life is not fair and life is not equal. However, certain things are not acceptable and we need to move much more towards an equal society. Where what, what do you think the role of business is in increasing accessibility diverse, and sort of making diverse and equal mm. culture? I think you just have to be very clear on your decision-making process and very careful with the language. And again, it's about standing up to those little jokes and banter mm. that comes out people's mouths, sometimes uncontrollably. You just have to go, sorry, no, not doing that. Um, you just have to be present and visible, I think. We've always said that, Judah and myself, both gay, um, leading up a, what we hope will be incredible, successful uh, architecture business. And there, there are a, a number of openly gay architects out there, but they're, they're a minority. Mm. And I think the more that we see, the greater people just accept as um, uh, nothing to talk about, but also to accept it with respect and understanding and, and remove ourselves from these kind of um, silly, childish uh, jokes or things that just aren't relevant anymore and they don't yeah. have any place in our professional lives or our private lives. Yeah, it's like it's just a it's, cultural constraint. That we're yeah. sort of... I think it's just one of those silly things that... <laughs> When, uh, you know, I don't want to make generalizations, but when there's a group of guys together on site, silly banter and jokes come out and there's no long, it's no longer a group of guys on site. There, is, there are women and there are people of all different kinds of races and uh, ethnic backgrounds, sexual backgrounds and gender identity backgrounds. And so the profession and the, the, our colleagues in the contractor, construction industry all need to shift and they all slowly are and it's all going in the right direction. We just need to help it continue in that direction. Yeah. That's really the key. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time Thank today you. and for uh, speaking with me. It's been great. Thanks very much. Cheers. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.